Hello, everyone. I hope you are having a good day today. How are you holding up during this Mercury retrograde in Pisces? It hasn't been too bad for me, you know. Nothing I can't handle or catastrophic. Where I live, the days are getting brighter and brighter, so I know daylight savings time is starting to creep up on me. I've been sleep training to wake up around 6 a.m. every morning, so when we spring forward by an hour in the U.S., I will be ready to wake up at 7 without feeling super tired. I want to do a small demo for you guys, as many of you have requested a more detailed mark making video, or asking how I draw with pens. This is completely personal preference, but I am not the biggest fan of ballpoint pens, just because I don't like the feathering marks it produces. It's something I could achieve using a mechanical pencil otherwise. Ballpoint pens have an off-putting color to me in drawings, but my favorite pen from Muji is ballpoint. And I enjoy writing with it because of how easily it glides my words across the page. I actually am reformatting a homework assignment I received as a freshman at Art Center College of Design. It was during our third semester, but Art Center runs on trimester, so technically it was my first year. But if you were to measure it to RISD's academic schedule, it would be first semester sophomore year, I suppose. Anyway. One week we had to do some studies of mark making from masters, and we were allowed to choose any illustrators we wanted. But we were heavily encouraged to look up 19th and 20th century artists, such as Harry Clark and Arthur Rackham. We were required to do two full sheets with little boxes just like this. Except for the sake of filming, I've enlarged my marks. It was done with 0.05 micron instead of 0.3, like what I'm using right now. Each full page took around eight to ten hours to complete, depending on how fast you work and how experienced you were with observational drawing, and I guess how much of a perfectionist you are. This one took me about two hours. There are several ways you can expand your vocabulary, if you will, and one of them is by varying line width, which would then suggest volume and form. And here, I demonstrated two different ways of going about that. One where the lines change thickness and sprout off of each other, and the other involving the same shape but as closed forms. I do think a big part of this is muscle memory, and after enough practice, your mind will be able to trust your hand and follow the line, which is quite therapeutic, actually. I love drawing hair and fur this way. Sometimes even rivers or streams of water. By creating line variety, you can describe a busy scene without becoming too trapped in detail. There is definitely stylization involved, even though you are observing and not drawing completely out of imagination. But by changing line direction or interchanging between shapes and thus grouping them visually, it makes the world you draw more believable. It is important in this exercise not to draft with pencil, because it teaches you how to improvise if you made a mistake. Even though I was looking at reference images, I still miscalculate distances and proportions. But I try to stay on top of it and make sure my overall voice is consistent to the artist I was studying. Because I was filming this in natural sunlight, the winter sky in New England is pretty cloudy, so please excuse the lighting here. The next two boxes, I decided to break down some more elements of the previous grass study by looking only at intersecting blades of grass. And how Harry Clark described the dark water and its ripples. I experimented with negative shape as I tried to find my happy spot, what I'm inclined towards, and how that may be different from the original. By drawing one or two lone strands going in a different direction, all of a sudden the lines seem grassier to me.
Mark making is suggestive and it's meant to communicate a gesture to evoke our impression of textures while simultaneously maintaining a narrative or emotional undertone. Because film and photography is so commonplace now and so easily self-curated, illustration must take advantage of its non-realisticness. A drawing should recognize itself as a drawing, and this in itself is not a fault or drawback. It brings the viewer into a parallel dimension of existence, in an alternate universe where this is reality and here a story unfolds. A technique I often utilize is directional hatching, and I combine this with what I call a Morse mark because it combines dots and dashes much like the Morse code. This adds value to a picture without overwhelming it with texture. Of course, it depends on how thick the lines are. Many engravings and intaglio prints use crosshatching to create value and the eye reads it as a whole. But with micron pens, I found that this is hard to achieve unless the scale is big enough. I had some trouble with this row of sky and storm clouds because I wasn't used to drawing with such a big pen. You can see how uneven some of my spacing is. Directional hatching is good for describing irregular shapes without flattening them out, and you can separate foreground, middle ground, background. I use dots for areas that are supposed to be close to white or to help a line fade out, but ideally the line here shouldn't draw too much attention, allowing the focus to be on the subject. Another technique is repetition or pattern, and I think Yamamoto Takato demonstrates this superbly through his paintings. I feel like he is influenced by Eroguro Nansensu, a genre popular in Japan and is characterized as a pre-war bourgeois cultural phenomenon that devoted itself to explorations of the deviant, the bizarre, and the ridiculous. The term itself means erotic grotesque, referring to the deformed and opulent rather than purely horror or gore. It's interesting to look back on history and see how these movements manifested. This one happened during the 1920s and I started thinking about America in the 20s versus Japan, what youth culture was like and how they contrasted from each other. Yamamoto uses many patterns in his works, juxtaposing them with elongated figures and ligaments, and experimenting with both symmetrical and asymmetrical composition. If you have a chance to look closely at his illustrations, you can see in some of them a background resembling a wallpaper, which is completely hand-drawn and painted.
When I was working on these studies, I paid close attention to how he abstracted the human body beyond comfort, tearing apart bones and organs and combining them with elements of nature and decay. Sometimes using negative space as line can make a bigger impression than a conglomerate of marks. Here I was looking at an illustration for a story by Edgar Allan Poe. It is a crop of a giant whirlpool and Harry Clark decided to use a black shaped circle underneath a series of white dotted lines to describe how deep and dark and terrifying the water was. He even put in a ship for scale. I love working this way because it reminds me of intergalactic space travel. I like how I say it reminds me as if I've experienced it, but you know. And I like how ambiguous a picture like this can be. Something that is simultaneously sea and star. For the last row at the bottom, I wanted to demonstrate drawing using closed shapes and prioritizing negative space. The most left is a study of Janet Fish, a pretty sloppy one at that, but I blame the pen. <laughs> I was so tempted to switch nibs, but I knew if I changed the line width, the overall page would feel out of balance and the other drawings would look way less detailed, so I stuck through with this reluctantly. The middle was referring to Mucha, who was active during the Art Nouveau period, and his works are characterized with pastel colors and beauty represented through nature and goddesses. He liked to weave hair and branches together by overlapping them and only lining the most outer contour, thus pushing them back in the picture and bringing out the sharpness of the woman's features, her gaze, her expression, the flower wreath on her hair, her jewelry, and so on. It's an illusion of creating immense detail but actually controlling where the viewer looks the entire time, juggling the descriptive and the stylized. I finished the last box here with a bramble and branch study that nestled a fairy but I didn't have enough space to put her in. I thought this would contrast well with the negative space drawing next to it. And now our demo is complete. Yang yang. It looks pretty good as a whole, I think. I'm happy with myself. I wanted to show how fine the lines can get using the same mark making techniques and how it can evoke an entirely different feeling because the line and space relationships are altered. Anyway, I hope you can give this exercise a try and that you enjoy this video. Have a wonderful day or night and I will talk to you soon. Bye bye!